Howard Bryant, that's his uh, giggle in the background. Metal Arc Media, you could catch what he's written recently on LeBron James for ESPN.com as well. Before we get to that, however, I want to discuss with him to see if he, like David Sampson, is uh, incredibly out of touch as he has aged because he doesn't know what a movie theater ticket price is either. Uh, everybody in this room said the movie theater has gotten awfully expensive. And David Sampson says it has not gotten that expensive, that it's still cheap. Where does Howard Bryant stand? When's the last time Howard Bryant was at a movie theater? And does he know what it costs to just go see a movie? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I, I think it depends. It depends on where you are. If you live in New York City, I think a movie's damn near $20. Um, 30 $30. $30. Thirty, yeah, exactly. If you're going to, if you're, if it's going to be either IMAX or if it's going to be in like real HD, you know, real, the real sound or whatever that stuff is, it's it's way crazy. For me, living in Western Massachusetts, it's still seventeen dollars and seventy five cents. Um, my son decided to get, he decided to get COVID for the second time in six months. So therefore, we may or may not be at Ant Man Quantumania tomorrow night. So uh, I go to the movies a lot. If, however, Dan, you are an independent movie person, an art house person like I am, whether it's Film Forum in New York or Amher Cinema at my house, still under $10. I know Roy has strong opinions on this. I wonder if the group does. Uh, the remake of White Men Can't no, Jump. No, is that, no, is no, no, that, phobe. Is that, is, that, is that necessary? Yes, I think it's coming out on Hulu uh, here in a, in a month or so, I believe it is. Uh, do, do we need, everything is nostalgia now. Everything gets remade. We are out of ideas, so we have to duplicate previous ideas. How do you feel about White Men Can't Jump being remade? Well, I didn't like the original. Is it called White Men Still Can't Jump? And or is it like white men can jump now because there's like Europeans in the game who actually like have hops? I was not a huge fan of the original, um, even though I love Ron Shelton's work. So it, it that doesn't excite me to know that there's a, a remake of that coming. It is popular. Your not being a fan of the original comes from where? I didn't think it was a great movie. Um, I thought it was. You know, I mean, obviously the Rosie Perez thing was kind of kind of funny a little bit. I mean, all the trash talking like sort of BS. I thought Marcus Johnson was funny because who doesn't want to see Marcus Johnson in a movie? And one of the reasons why I sort of liked seeing him in there wasn't just because he was, you know, walking around with a gun and a scarf over his, over his face or um, some nylons over his face, but also because you get to see in real time how tall basketball people really are around regular regular folk and so um it just wasn't a, it wasn't a great movie it wasn't it was supposed to be funny but it was it really wasn't I, I didn't laugh and i didn't think that the two characters i mean they were both losers and in their own sense and it just it just didn't hit me. Bull Durham hit me. I thought Bull Durham's you know, probably Ron Shelton's best movie, but I just didn't love White Men Can't Jump. You're a bigger baseball fan than you are a basketball fan, correct? That is not true. That is not true. I'm a bigger baseball fan than I am a football fan. But basketball and baseball and tennis are my three favorites. Well, let me ask you this from a history and perspective standpoint as it relates to the NBA. As foreign players continue to take some of the top spots and – Jokic is someone that is a bit of an unknown superstar. How long before the NBA has a problem, a tipping point problem, because Americans aren't going to celebrate foreigners the way that they celebrate Americans? Well, he can't jump either, so maybe they can just sort of make him an honorary uh, American, you know, when this movie comes out. You know, I, it's funny, you know, Dan, I never sensed that. I think that the genius of what the NBA did with the Dream Team and the fact that all the European players had idolized Americans really took away a bit of the xenophobia, the way you get it in baseball, where people think the game is, you know, too Latin or when hockey, you know, when when the Iron Curtain sort of, you know, fell and, you know, you had a bunch of Russian players and, a, you know, a bunch of Slovakian and Slovenian players. And, you know, a lot of, you know, the Bobby Clarks of the world were sort of like, yeah, you know, what happened to the Canadian game? Basketball never really suffered from that. I don't think I mean, the the, the white American player is pretty much gone. I mean, who's the greatest white American player in the game right now? Who's the best? Pat Gordon Connaughton. Hayward? Ah. <laughs> Connaughton. Um, that's a sad commentary in of itself. He is the best, right? I mean, but the NBA hasn't really suffered but from that. And so I think they've done it a lot, a lot more smoothly. I think people 
are I, I don't think there's going to be a crash like that. Um, but absolutely, in the other sports, you could tell the more foreign the game got, the more they had to deal with it. It doesn't have to be as sinister as xenophobia. It can be as hard as trying to sell somebody who's trying to sell their personality in their second yeah, language. Right. Well, who's I mean, what do they always say about the NBA? You know, you got to be white, bright, and polite, right? There's got to be the white dude out there that you that you follow. Um, who who is the saleable, marketable white NBA player right now? Who who would that guy be? I mean, Jokic is is maybe the best player, but I mean, I don't know. How's Lucas Jersey selling? How do people warm to him? Is he the you know? I, I don't know if you're if you look at any of those guys as the you know the face of the league normally what happens when you have a white player like back in the day you know you had a guy and you sort of elevated his abilities because you really 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 wanted him to succeed but i think that's you know in the age of jordan kobe Shaq, lebron steph and now Giannis and the rest of them i don't know if that's really necessary jess was joking about pat Connaughton, obviously no she wasn't tyler she was, hero that's tyler hero yeah, yeah. absolutely is, tyler, hero. is the greatest tyler. of the white American and, and luca luca's fourth in nba selling jerseys behind steph lebron and another non-american player in Giannis, who also is I mean, probably yeah. someone who defies this as well so if you get the dallas mavericks somehow in the nba finals do you think the world sort of warms to luca like can he carry can he carry the league, do you think? I mean, because that's really what it's all about. If you have a guy, you know, the 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 white NBA player who happens to be the best player in the league, like hands down, usually gets all kinds of shine, right? You know, whether you're foreign or not. But I don't know if there's a white player in the league that can do that these days because there's so much competition. I mean, Giannis and Steph and the rest of it, you know, they're just – and LeBron is still on the, is still on the scene. So I think it's going to be a couple of years at least before that litmus test sort of comes where you're like, okay, do, you know, does the foreign NBA player still carry enough juice to, you know, to lead the league? I don't think that we can normalize LeBron still being this kind of great and this kind of, of relevant. It doesn't even make any sense, Howard. I mean, Michael Jordan was washed at this age. Yeah. You, you know, what's amazing about LeBron and, to me, I, I didn't even know this, but, you know, he's in the top 10 of like virtually every offensive category. It's incredible, like how much he's at, at 38 at this stage when you're breaking records when you're breaking records. Like when you think about Hank Aaron breaking the all time home run record, he's 40 years old. He can barely move. He's not an athlete. When you're looking even Kareem, you know, in 84, when he when he broke the record, you know, against Utah. You know, Kareem wasn't the number one or the number two option in the offense. Even back then, it was, you know, magic worthy. And, you know, of course, you know, you had a moment where Kareem could take over in a short series. LeBron James can still on any night be the best player in the NBA after 20 years. And that's, I don't, I don't think anyone's ever been able to, to say that. However, you know, I sent Mike Shore a text the other day. Did you know that LeBron James is 193rd all-time in offensive rebounds. Russell Westbrook has more offensive rebounds than LeBron. Stats are wild. I would have never, ever thought that. He did credit you for his stat of the day, which seemed stolen and lazy for the Metal Arc media uh, hierarchy to be, uh, you know, he's an intern here. He's doing the stat <laughs> of the day, and he's going to Howard Bryant to get his stats. It's lazy. Did he use that one? Yes. Oh, that's great. Right. I love that, right? However... The, the real fun with Mike is our mutual hatred of the Miami Heat. But I have respect for the Heat. He hates them, like loathes them. And like, he'll, I'll give a text. If the Heat win a, a game by under five points, it's like luckiest team. No, he's the worst. I mean, wow. he, he's How spreading this. How many people this, does he text about this? spreading this <laughs> Not me, all over America. It's, it's. I don't know if he's also doing it internationally. It's a poisonous Disturbing. hatred he has. Can you uh, explain to the audience, though, the most impressive things as you see them on the LeBron resume? Because it seems, from what you've written, that you're more impressed by other things than just the basketball. Or, or less impressed. I mean, I think that what it, when it comes to LeBron, well, one, you know, I'm a language guy. So watching people mangle the word legacy just drives me bananas all the time. You know, I'm just I'm just trying to afford, you know, you know, further my legacy. It's not your legacy, dog. It's your accomplishments. Their accomplishments are un LeBron's accomplishments are unreal. I think that I think that eight straight finals, nine out of ten with three different teams is ridiculous. 
I mean, we never had that really. Maybe you can throw, you know, Chamberlain in there, but there really aren't maybe Shaq in 06, but that was Dwayne Wade's team, you know, where you had the guy be the guy for two championships on uh, championships on two different teams. But for him to essentially for virtually a decade, whatever team he was on was the favorite to go to the NBA finals, I, I think is just one of the most remarkable things ever. Um, and I don't know if you're going to see that. Um, I, but when I talk about LeBron, where I think he's really sort of the most influential, and it's not necessarily a compliment, is the fact that he was able to decouple um, himself from both team and coach. He's completely singular. And I think you could feel that in some of that awkwardness when he broke the record. You could sort of feel the fact that he's not a – is he a Laker? Like, who do you identify LeBron James with? Obviously, his greatest years, I think, are in are in Miami. His most influential years are probably in his second uh, stint with Cleveland. But he identifies with no coach. There's no Phil. You know, there's no Auerbach to his Russell. There's no Belichick to his Brady. He's his own guy. You know, is he a Laker? I mean, was that 2020 championship about the Lakers? Or was it the fact that six guys, half the damn roster was, you know, was on Clutch Sports' roster. I mean, so he really is his own person. And then you see this new generation of guys trying to duplicate that, you know, the KD and Kyrie's and this dynasty that never happened, the super team stuff that never happened. And so his influence is more that this generation is going to try to follow him as the decoupled one. And I think that this disaster in Brooklyn, hopefully what it's done is it's made team owners recognize that this stuff only works with LeBron. He's one of a kind. Don't don't try this at home. Don't try to emulate. Don't copy this. The other guys can't do it, no matter how much they may want to. So what would be his enduring legacy then? I think his enduring legacy is going to be the the end of team. That that most of these players I I believe that for sports to matter I don't think that cult of personality can really work long term. And I look at Le when I look at LeBron's legacy, I see one thing. I see James Harden, I see Kevin Durant, and I see Kyrie Irving all having played for four teams, and they're still essentially in their prime. And I don't know if that's good for the league. I think at some point the team and the league have to – I mean, the, the player in the team have to align to, to have it matter. You know, uh, maybe maybe I'm totally wrong. And maybe it's all just going to be cult of personality, individual. But can you really watch? You know, can the game succeed without having tentpole teams? So then how do you measure the significance of a player? Because if, if LeBron is completely untethered, he is sort of a, a, a singular figure in that you just say his name and it, it conjures all these things. But I've kind of mentioned that like Kevin Durant, I think is embarked on one of the worst possible versions of his career, just purely on the basis of b bouncing from place to place. And in mm -hmm. theory, he should be viewed as one of the great figures of all time. And he will still be viewed as one of the great basketball players of all time, but not in this incredible significance. He's just sort of, I think, going to come and go probably more than he should have. Well, the message that has been sent since 2003, especially, I mean, you got to remember that LeBron, when he comes into the league, he's already loaded. He's got a $90 million contract with Nike before he makes his first shot. And so this whole idea of empire, this whole idea of more than an athlete, more than a vote, that every, that everything is going to be branded through him. The propaganda of LeBron James, the fact that he's a guy who has his own production company, that he barely does any interviews unless he actually owns the airwave or has an equity stake in the airwaves that he's doing the interviews on, that sending that message that this is the pathway is, you know, I think it's pretty dangerous. I think it's propaganda, and I think it's not really going to serve folks very well. And when you look at someone like like Durant, we would identify with Durant so differently if he had identified with one team. But maybe this whole thing was BS all along, and that the, the, the teams that had so much power, eventually it was going to tilt completely in the other direction. What are you doing? Hanging on to old man sentiment? Do you think the last 15 years have actually been basketball uh, bad for basketball in terms of interest? Well, no, I don't. And I think part of the reason is because LeBron is that damn good. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Other people can't duplicate him. 
And I think you also have something else. And I don't think it's being an old man at all. I mean, I think you have the Warriors. The Warriors are the Warriors are extremely current. They are the dynasty, and they do it in the old school way. Steph and Clay and Draymond, they they live with the Warriors as the Warriors have gone as a franchise. So have they as players. Is Steph Curry the same guy we're talking about if he's played for four teams right now? I mean, I think that identification really does sort of matter. Um, but maybe it doesn't. Like I said, I mean, maybe it so turns out that the way that a new generation is going to watch basketball is going to be without teams, that the teams, you know, the Brooklyn Nets, Dan, went from a team you cared about to they just went back to mediocre. It's like it never happened. I mean, when you, as a as a viewer, do you require that identification? Do you guys require that identification? Because if I, you don't, I cared, I cared about the Nets uh, more uh, the last couple of seasons than I cared about them when they were making the finals with Richard Jefferson and Vince Carter or any incarnation of the Nets. Actually, I found them more interesting. That doesn't make it uh, necessarily something that's popular, but I don't think polarization or having people like Kyrie Irving not have an affiliation hurts their star power very much. They might not get no, commercials, really but Kyrie Irving is about as famous as Steph Curry somehow. Yeah, yeah, but when you assess their careers, you know, are you going to put them in the same category? No, but I'm not doing it with sentiment and I need you tied to a coach or a team. I'm not holding that Michael Jordan played for the Wizards against a coach I don't remember against him at the no, end. I I, 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 when I've seen the LeBron coverage recently, it seems like they like to erase the Miami years. It seems like there's an eagerness to place him with other teams, whether it's the Cavs or the Lakers, because there's an eagerness from the customer, the fan base, the media to have someone associated with a thing. But I also think LeBron has shown that he kind of doesn't want to give Riley and the Heat organization the kind of credit over his career that he also wants to separate himself from that time because the more he says spoisms or seems like oh the the heat taught him how to win it sort of takes away his own agency and what he's achieved in his career so he himself is eager to do that yeah it's 100 percent right but also dan i don't think it's necessary either what i'm saying is is that witty asked me what i thought the enduring legacy of lebron was going to be and i think it is that separation you know, I mean, I think that that's the, that's what because I think the other players coming up are going to follow that. I, I don't think that it's going to be I think the Steph Curry's of the world are the dinosaurs. But you isn't know, the, isn't the legacy then empowerment of the player, though, Howard, because what you're saying, the need for team, for structure, for organization, for coach, for leader, uh, LeBron has wanted to break free from that to tell, you, no, it's the player that's all powerful. It's me. That's absolutely right. I, I, I am. I'm why you come and watch the game. And it is. And as I as I was saying in this piece I wrote the other day was you can make the argument that the presence of LeBron James is the ultimate labor victory. This is the battle that you've been trying that these guys have been trying to win since Marvin Miller since the 1960s, that we're the reason you buy the tickets. I'm the guy you come to see the name on the back of the jersey is way more important than the name on the front. And you're right. You know, there was a lot of discussion back in December that Kyrie Irving would have nowhere to go, that his career was over. Kyrie Irving is as valuable now as he was when he was leaving Cleveland. I mean, he's that it is the talent trap. He's that good. They do have that much star power. My my question uh, when I see that, though, when you look at these guys is, is similar to what we were just talking about is. How are you going to view these guys long term when it's all said and done? Does Kevin Durant pay a price in your mind for being identified with no one, even though he's got what? Durant's got what? Two titles? Yes. Uh, none in Stugatz's personal record book, but uh, <laughs> but uh, two according to all the other record books. Uh, Howard, good yeah. talking to you. Thank you, sir, for making the time around here. We appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks. Look at that. Stan Van Gundy learned something today. An old man learned something <laughs> technological today. It's only been his last seven appearances that have been interrupted by incessant <laughs> beeping. And now he has finally learned in a professional broadcast setting, you know what? I might want to turn off this beeping sound. I might want to learn something incredibly simple. You know what, Levitard? 
Like, I really need that. Just get up in the morning, come on your show, and you just give me shit. <laughs> Good seeing you, Stan. Always makes me happy to see your face. Uh, I wanted to start this segment, though, with Billy, because Billy, last night, hey. on The Masked Singer, somehow Dick Van Dyke, at 97 years old, was performing on The Masked Singer. A stunner. Met with universal respect applause because a lot of people learn when that mask came off that Dick Van Dyke was still alive. I thought that he was already on the mask. I've fallen off. Like since we were not on ESPN and mask singer wasn't being used as a passive aggressive tactic to take shots at the bosses. I haven't watched <laughs> ESPN as, or the mask singer as much as I did before. So I, I was thinking because of the Super Bowl, I don't know, Stan, how you experienced the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl like jams so many new shows down our throat. I'm like, Man, maybe this is the season that I catch back up with the mass singer and see what's going on. But I didn't because last night was the finale of the challenge, Dan. A hundred hour finale, the longest one ever. So I had to watch that. So then I thought, whatever, I'll just catch up on the mass singer next week. But there was two eliminations yesterday. So I don't know if I'm gonna be able to jump back in. Stan, how do you feel about the mass singer? Are you a fan of music and pageantry Stan and Stan just watches those stinky I, CBS shows. I have, so I've never seen the mass singer. Oh, singer. Man. Go back never to the seen. first season. It was a classic, Stan. Can we play which dead celebrity would we like to be revealed to us through the mass singer is still alive? Because I think Elvis would make waves. I feel like we're Tupac. I feel like we're close. And at Stan, is that a Diet Coke? I love that you're having a Diet Coke. At yes, it is a Diet Coke. I, I get yes. judged all the time if I cross the hall and I drink a Coke. Because sometimes at 930, I just need a little pick-me-up. You know what I mean? Like Just exactly need a little right. something to get my blood boiling and get my body moving. And people judge me for that. So me and you are the same in that What's sense. What's the earliest, stand that you will have? The very earliest you will have a Diet Coke? Uh, whenever I wake up. So, mm -hmm. you know, if like tomorrow morning, I think... Uh, I'm up at four o'clock, so that'll be when I have it. Yeah, that's disgusting. No, Dan. how dare you, Dan? How dare you? Come on, an well, invited guest. What's the guest. difference having a diet coke or having a cup of coffee? Exactly I mean, right. Put it on the poll. One is sugary sweet in a way that's unpleasant and uh, artificial, and coffee is wonderful. Wait a minute! I have a diet coke is sugar free, and most people I know mm. are putting sugar in their coffee, so mm -hmm. I'm not buying that one. Put it on the poll at Lebetard Show, please. Is having a Diet Coke first thing uh, in the morning when you wake up disgusting? Yeah, I, I hard disagree on that too, Dan. You're not going to find an ally here. Stan, this is what I tell people because a lot of people are very judgy around here. I'm like, do you know what Coke does to your inside? Have you seen the video of what Coke does to an engine? I'm like, yeah, it cleans the shit out of an engine. My insides are super clean right now. Like there's there nothing go. going on inside me. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about Coke Zero versus Diet Coke? No, I'm not a Coke Zero fan. Me neither. A lot of people are. They say that it tastes the same as Coke. I don't feel it. I don't I don't taste What's it. What's the difference between Coke Zero and Diet Coke? What is the taste difference? Coke Zero has zero sugar, Dan, or zero calories. Zero something. There's a zero in there. Well, Diet Coke, Some he just zero claimed that on. Diet Coke had zero Diet sugar. Diet Coke doesn't have sugar either. I don't know. The taste is different, though. Yeah. You can definitely tell a little bit of a difference there. Mm -hmm. I mean. Did you know that Dick Van Dyke was still alive? Well, I don't remember hearing that he was dead, so. But it was you something I don't you assumed. I've really for a while, thought right? about Dick Van Dyke one way or another um, in quite a long time. A, a ninety-seven-year-old little... man being able to perform on the Mass Singer is pretty impressive. It is a tribute to laughter as medicine to keep you alive late in life. I think we'd have to see the performance before we say what a great performance it was. I mean, he was eliminated at first, and I would imagine there's probably mobility issues. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think he was jumping around, doing things. I honestly worry, and this is going to go to a grim place, so I'm sorry, Stan. I'm worried that we're going to have a situation, because The mass Singer is taped, where, like, a contestant like that appears on The mass Singer oh, no. and then is revealed post-mortem. Because no. of the way the recording goes. No. You're, that someone's going to die on the air? No, that... not on the air. Like, between the time of filming and, and, and when it was released, like, natural causes will oh, come in. And then saying. how do we handle you this think, situation? You think the people who were making The Masked Singer were scared in the months following the making of The Masked Singer because Dick Van Dyke what might have passed before they could air it? It's I... like when People Magazine did the Betty White Turns 100 magazine cover, yeah. and they published it, and then it went to print, and before... It actually went out on newsstand. She died. It's a fear that I have that I don't think a lot of other people have. And I don't know if it's like 
that I'm being ageist. I don't think it's ageism. I think I just have like a respect for the elderly and death and knowing that it's a very real thing, right? So like I <laughs> I had a couple weeks ago a conversation that wasn't well received, so I'll obviously bring it up again today. I was worried when they when they had when 80 for Brady was coming out, Stan. Do you know 80 for Brady, the movie? Uh, I don't know. Oh, Stan. What? Oh no, the movie? I've seen the I've seen the trailer for the movie, yes. Y yeah. So I ask here, and I don't know if it made it on air or not. I ask here, do you think when you have, you know, like four septuagenarians, octogenarians scheduled for an interview, like do you think they plan out like what if we just have three that day? What if only two make it to the day? Not because of like necessarily like they've passed, but like, is that something that's taken into account? It's just a thing that I think about. Like, what are all the contingency plans just in case? I don't even understand case? what you're, it's, are you worried that someone's going to pass of natural causes and you got to be careful whether you have all four of the 80 year old women doing publicity together? I'm not even sure what your controversial opinion is. I'm, I, it's, a th it's a thought that's gone through my head. Do you plan for that? Do you continue the media tour? Do you have the three shots set up versus do the they four have shot. an emergency plan yeah what are the contingencies rita moreno dies uh at some point in the what are you I doing mean, i'm, I'm sure i mean in, in the planning for 80 for brady i i presume that they must have like hey, they're probably telling the editors hey chop chop we got to get this thing out not to like bring down the mood but this happens all the time with films billy people die after they finish filming a movie and then or before it the, happened finished. with the movie triangle of sadness that was nominated for an academy what award this year the lead actress passed away in the span of the time between when they finished taping and when the movie came out ray liotta passed uh, during the filming of blackbird what are you watching these days stan is it still all the cbs stuff it's it's all the fireman shows and uh, whatever else it is that's on cbs as cbs continues and less moonves who's been disgraced and left there his legacy echoes giving you cruddy television that you love okay first of all dan the chicago shows Chicago Med, Chicago Fire, Chicago PD are on NBC, not CBS. Big sign. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. And and yes, I'm still watching those, but never, never on the night they run because we're always on the road. And like last night, I was watching basketball games, so they're all recorded. I'll. I'll catch him there or on Peacock or whatever. But Would yeah, you want I'll... us to try and get you to be able next time you're in Chicago like you are now to get an extra role in one of these favorite shows of yours where you're just wandering around in the background somewhere as an extra? Well, you know, I was going to last night. I thought about it. I should have gone over to Chicago Med and just stopped in and seen some of the doctors. I was going to ask that. If when you get to Chicago, you get really excited, or like you're in Chicago visiting, you're like, let me Are start. Are there Chicago sightseeing tours? Let me start a little fire here just to see if my favorite firefighters come to put it out, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, but but I didn't do that. Maybe next time. <laughs> Stan, do you know what the uh, price of a movie yeah. ticket is? Uh, I haven't been in a while, but I'm going to say it's, uh, I think the last time... I paid twelve fifty. Um, what decade? When's the last time you were at a movie theater? Ah, you know what? It's been a while. Um, well, I'm trying to think what the last time I saw in a theater. I mean, um, I think Elvis is the last one I saw in a theater. What is your review? I liked it. I, I you know what I like about the music movies is, even if the movie's not great the music's going to be good so you're going to enjoy it so so we'll go to virtually all of the you know music movies i mean you know we saw the freddie mercury one and the elton john and uh you know i mean we'll go to all of those those so. movies are bad though That's right why you'd oh, love no. the mass singer well i don't I, well, listen i i forget the name of it but i thought the freddie mercury one was great bohemian I rhapsody yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody. I thought that was really, really good. Um, you know, the, the last, so I have a couple of guys, one that I work with at TNT, a young guy, and then a friend of my daughter's. They're both like, you know, sort of uh, amateur film critics. They watch like virtually everything that comes out and they give you the reviews. And so they were both telling me, oh, you got to watch Banshees of Inishirin. So... I'm like, all right, not usually what I would pick. I watch that movie on a plane ride 
I don't get it. I had to text both of them and say, you got to tell me <laughs> what it is you like about this what? movie. It was, it's getting it great. Was depressing. It's getting great. It reviews. was terrible. I mean, <laughs> no, wow. that's a terrible the worst depressing. movie I have seen in a long time. And it's one of those. I stuck with it. I wanted to quit. Stan is not you know, spitting an hour right now. into the movie. And I'm like, well, these two guys, you know, like they're really into movies and, you know, they they really analyze these things. It must get better at the end. No, it kept getting worse. It was uh, absolutely a horrible movie. And it's, and it's nominated for all these awards. Then I watched The Woman King, and I love that movie, and it's nominated for nothing. I mean, Viola Davis can't get a nomination, but the guys in Banshees of Inishirin do? you got to be kidding. I am here. I am here for Stan Van Gundy's acidic reviews of movies that are universally applauded, getting ratings in the 90s because it's too depressing, and Stan Van Gundy has no, no, no time no. for Here's your art house happens, stuff. Here's what happens, Stan. Here's what happens. Everybody watches that movie and think it sucks. But mm -hmm. the thing is, is they, the critics all tell you, oh, this movie's great and the cinematography. You can't say So it. you want to act like all sophisticated, like you actually right. noticed Man, this that's crap. not true. So you mm -hmm. say you like the yeah. movie. No one actually liked that I movie. I liked that, that right. movie. It was horrible. Exactly. It was really good, and it was funny. Oh, I think it, which, it was too nuanced. It went over your head on a little it tiny, was, on a little oh, tiny oh, white oh, screen. Oh, you oh, know, that's that's exactly on the big screen what I'm stand. saying. You want to be able to say, like, oh, yeah, it's nuanced and the all score, this. The score, the costume really design. score was great. And get it. Like, it's just... Just admit it. It was a terrible movie. Well, you, you like Bohemian enjoy Rhapsody. Enjoy a single so minute of it. We're it even. was horrible. Like, what's wrong with saying that? Like, I don't know what the hell point they were trying to make, <laughs> but this movie sucked. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> it's such a great movie poster. I, I, I like Stan Van Gundy. I don't know what they were trying to say. I would like his quote on the movie poster. I don't know what they were trying to say, but the movie sucked. Wasn't it about two guys who didn't want to be friends or one guy who wanted to be friends? And one guy didn't want to movie. be friends anymore. The other guy kept trying to be friends. So then the first guy who didn't want to be friends started chopping off his fingers, for God's sake. Oh, his one finger got swallowed by a Jesus donkey Christ. who freaking died. I mean, yeah, what, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Hey! Leave this gonna, out. I'm not going to say it, but hey. Spoiler alert. Um, Spoiler alert. There's nothing to spoil. I hope people won't go see it. That movie was awful. <laughs> This is the strongest. You watched opinion. it on a plane on like a two inch screen. Is it possible that that might not oh, have been the best like viewing a experience? A bigger screen was going to make the movie better. I mean, I'll give you it was a beautiful setting. That's great. I mean, so just, you know, give me a Rick Steves travel thing and I can watch it. You know, I don't need that ridiculous Who? movie. It was awful. That movie was awful. I can't believe. And it's nominated for all these awards because, you know, I mean, all these movie snobs and the whole thing. Like, there was not one interesting part of that movie. And you're saying that if I make it a bigger screen, I'm just giving you more room to watch an awful movie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I, I look. It was beautiful. The location was beautiful. So on a bigger screen, I would probably even more so say, wow, that's beautiful. And this movie sucks. <laughs> Let's talk some basketball with Stan. He is in Chicago. Your thoughts on uh, the Phoenix Suns Nets trade. Your thoughts on the entire Nets experience. Well, I mean, the Nets experience was absolute chaos for four years. I mean, and that's why I think like even with Phoenix, so, and, and I thought Phoenix made a great move and you know, they're going to go for it. I always applaud that. So it's good, but I think the proper response always to NBA trades and everything else is we'll see because on July the 1st of 2019, Everybody was sure that the Brooklyn Nets were building a dynasty. Oh, that's it. How many championships are they going to win? And here we are three and a half years later, and they won one playoff series and were no 
factor really in the league were pretty irrelevant for most of those three and a half years. You just don't know how things are going to work out. There's too many variables with injuries and with all the other things that can happen in terms of chemistry and all of that. So when I look at Phoenix, it should work. You know, Chris Paul, Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, DeAndre Ayton, it should work. They should be really good. I think the the questions are how quickly does Durant get healthy and how healthy does he get? You know, can Chris Paul stay healthy, which hasn't been a given um, as he's gotten older? And then do they have enough time here to really pull it together against teams um, who have been together all year? And you don't want to give away this season because Durant is getting older and has injury problems. Chris Paul's getting near the end. I don't know when it'll come. So it's not like you have a huge window, and I don't know how quickly it can work this year. But but on paper, it's really, really good. On paper, you'd have them as the best team in the West right now. You'd favor them? If I made you bet on uh, who's going to win the title, who would you bet as the favorite? Oh, no, I think the title will come down to the teams in the East. I, I think the three best teams are in the East. I, I think Boston, Milwaukee, and Philly um, are all better than everybody in the, uh, in the West, including Phoenix. Um, and, and look, it, it's close. I like Phoenix's roster, but Boston, Milwaukee, and Philly will have been together all year playing at a high level and, you know, developing their chemistry and – you know, their team defense and all the things that go with that, uh, I'll, I'll take whoever comes out of the East. Um, but I think the West is wide open, and I think on paper you would probably take Phoenix to uh, to win the West. I think the Clippers probably still have the deepest roster in the West, and Golden State's still the only team out there in the West where they know their core is capable of winning a championship, but we're, we haven't even seen Golden State play well in spurts. I mean, they've played well at home when they've had everybody, but they've never even gotten on a seven or eight game run where there's a mix of home games and away games where you say, wow, this team's really coming on. And, and so I've got a lot of doubts about them. Denver's been great all year. Um, if I had to pick a team to win the West, I would say the Western Conference Finals come down to, depending on how the brackets go, would come down to Phoenix and uh, and Denver. But in saying that you don't think that Phoenix is even a top three contender, you would probably say, though, that that team is the best collection of talent in the NBA, just sort of on paper. I know he it's did, on I, I think he did say that. Right. But well, I, I do. I mean, it's per especially their top four guys. And, you know, the benches become a little less important in the playoffs. I think the the best roster top to bottom is the Clippers. I mean, you know, I, I think that they go 11 or 12 deep um, with really, really good players. So um, I, I like them, but they also have not, even as they've gotten healthier, you know, you see spurts of it um, where you think, wow, this team's really got what it takes. But then – it just never seems to last for very long. So I, I don't really trust anybody in the West, to be honest. And, I mean, even Phoenix, there's no way to right now say, oh, yeah, that's the best team. We're just looking at names on, on a piece of paper, and who knows when Durant's going to play, and let's see what happens on the floor. I'm just saying it should work in Phoenix. But where I wanted to go with that question was between them and even, you know, Luka and Kyrie and Dallas, it seems as though more is being taken into consideration than just who has the most talent. I know that's always sort of been the case, but I think with the way that the Brooklyn experiment failed and the way that other sort of mega talented teams have failed, that it's not always just who has the most talent anymore, correct? Oh, it's not just that. I mean, but, but look, the number one thing is talent. I mean, that's certainly the starting point. I mean, you can have all these other great intangibles, you know, they're unselfish and they've got great chemistry and all this. I mean, 
that's all well and good. I mean, you've got to have the talent to start with. So that leaves you with a fairly short list of teams that are talented enough um, to win a championship. Um, but yeah, then there's other things and, you know, the defensive end of the floor and, um, you know, and then the luck. Nobody ever wants to talk about luck, but luck's a huge part of it always with with injuries and everything else. I mean, we saw Toronto win a championship and a big factor in that, I don't want to take anything away from them, but Golden State had nobody left to play in that final. You, you just know, took Phoenix something away from them. The you, you, you took something away from them. You don't want to take yeah, something away Phoenix, from them, but you they, did take something when away When Phoenix from them. went to the finals and lost to Milwaukee, they – they're down 2-1 in the first round, and then Anthony Davis, shockingly, went down with an injury. And so they're able to come back on them. Then they get Denver without Murray and Porter in the second round, and then they get the Clippers without Kawhi Leonard in the, in the Western Conference Finals. So, you know, I mean, luck has a, has a lot to do with it. And, you know, people don't want to talk about luck, but... We don't know who's going to get lucky here when we hit the playoffs. On paper, do we need to update that phrasing in the digital age? Is it no longer the Phoenix Suns have the best team or the best talent on paper? I'm willing. I'm willing to hear alternatives, but I think on paper is still it's still the best way. But I, but it's not on paper anymore, right? It's not something we're but using like on, paper. But like on your it is if you're Stan Van Gundy, mine's on paper. Mm -hmm. I have the rosters in front of me oh. on paper, so. Yes, it is for me. Stan, before we let you go, what are you burning on politically these days? And I should remind everyone he's got the game on TNT tonight. He is as good as anyone doing it, breaking down these games. He's gotten very good. He was raw at the beginning, but he's gotten very good, and his partners uh, set him up in a way that makes Stan Van Gundy. What's, what's that supposed to mean? He was raw at the beginning, trying well, nice to under, like, oh, he's okay now. Oh, I think he Jeez. would. I think he'd agree with that. No, he was the best from the start, right, Stan? Uh, no, oh. and, and I'm not the best <laughs> now either. So luckily, you know, my partner, Brian Anderson is. And so, uh, you know, he not only sets me up like Dan says, but he coaches me and, and that helps a, uh, a great deal. So I still make a lot of mistakes, but I've got people that, um, will correct me and then I can, uh, and then I can move on. But politically, Dan, I mean, I'm pretty fortunate in the fact that uh, the governor of my great state of Florida, um, Ron DeSantis, gives me stuff virtually every day that is pretty easy to uh, get fired up about, whether he is banning books that were either written about people of color or by people of color. Those are all now subject to review. Um, we can't teach... African-American history because, God forbid, we might make some white kids uncomfortable. And quite honestly, I think the kids can handle anything that comes at them pretty well. It's the uh, snowflake parents who are the ones who don't want to uh, feel uncomfortable. And then, and then we've got Ron DeSantis, you know, from the small government cut regulation party, the the uh, Republicans who are always, you know, you're hearing their rhetoric on small government. Now, if you're a high school girl and you want to play sports in Florida, you know, you got to go report your menstrual cycles to school officials, not to medical people, to school officials, because that fits right into small government. You know, I mean, it becomes insane. I mean, there's, this guy is... I would say a wannabe authoritarian, but he's got a legislature in Florida that will do his bidding no matter what it is. And so he actually is a, an authoritarian. He's got total control of the state. He does what he wants. No one will stand up to him in his own party. And meanwhile, we've got major problems in Florida with housing affordability, with people who don't have health insurance, over 20% of our population. The homeowner's insurance crisis is ridiculous. Our wages are low. Our public schools are underperforming. We're not addressing any of those issues, 
But you know what? Ron DeSantis will protect us from drag shows. And so you can all feel really good in Florida because Ron will not let kids under 18 go to drag shows. Now, financially, you're going to have a hard time, but, but Ron will keep those drag shows away from your door. Always good seeing your Stan smiling spitting. face. Yeah, he was spitting. Uh, see you later, Stan. It's nice seeing you. Uh, get, to, get to wherever your televisions are and watch him tonight on TNT. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Bye. Banshees doesn't suck. Everyone should still go watch it.